Good evening, everyone, and welcome to The Real Science Exchange, the podcast where leading scientists and industry professionals meet over a few drinks to discuss the latest ideas and trends in animal nutrition. Hi, I'm Scott Sorrell. I'm going to be one of your hosts here tonight at Real Science Exchange, and tonight we're discussing a great paper during one of my favorite segments. I always say it, Bill. My favorite segment is the uh, the Journal Club. I'm not sure if that's because you're my favorite professor or I just like the Journal Club. Maybe a little bit of both. Um, before we dive in, Bill, um, uh, would you mind uh, uh, introducing the guest that you brought with you tonight? Uh, sure, Scott. Good to, good to be back. Uh, the guest tonight is Dr. Alex Herstoff from the the Pennsylvania State University. <laughs> we <laughs> they're are. The, they're the other the. Uh, welcome, <laughs> Alex. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so... Yeah, Bill, Bill and I are both Ohio Staters, but uh, I've paid far more tuition to uh, Penn State University than I have uh, uh, Ohio State. I've got two sons. Oh, good. To Ohio State. Thank you. One, yeah, one graduates in two weeks, uh, a semester oh, early, good. by the way. So, yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, good kid. Bill, I forgot to ask. We are in the pub, uh, your favorite place. Uh, what, what's in your glass tonight? I've got a glass of Narragansett Lager. From uh, from Connecticut or Rhode Island, I'm not sure. Very tasty. Yeah. All right. Do you ever have anything other than beer? I'm not sure you've had anything different than a not, beer not before usually. here. Not usually. Once no. in a while, a bourbon. But <laughs> Dr. Ristoff, uh, uh, well, welcome. It's it's great to have you here. I've heard your name many many times in the past, usually associated with your work on histidine, and so very interested in that and, and, and may have to have you come on to our, our webinar to talk about some of your work with histidine at, at some point. It, it's, uh, it's very good work. Um, before we get started, uh, are you drinking anything special tonight? Well, I'm drinking a 15-year-old uh, single malts. Uh, as I said, it's a little early for me, but uh, I had to follow your format. <laughs> Uh, exactly. Well, thank you. I'm glad, glad you did. You're, you're drinking something far better than what I have tonight. But before I get into that, I'm going to uh, introduce my co-host. This is the first time I've had Dr. Uh, Marcos Zenobi. Marcos, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much, Scott. Yeah. It's a pleasure. So those of you that may have followed uh, some of the choline research that we've done may recognize uh, the name. Uh, Marcos did a lot of the research uh, with, with Reassure down at the University of Florida. So we, we certainly welcome you tonight. Uh, Marcos, he's, uh, he's in Argentina. Uh, and what, what's in your glass tonight, Marcos? I'm having a Malbec, a red wine from Mendoza, close to the Andes. So it's my favorite, so Yeah, cheers. perfect, perfect. And tonight I'm having what we call a Russell's Reserve uh, Kentucky Straight Bourbon. Uh, not, not quite as good as what uh, Dr. Ristoff is having, but uh, it's, it's gonna have to do for today. Gentlemen, I look forward to the conversation this evening. Cheers. Cheers. New research is changing everything we thought we knew about choline's impact on the cow and her calf, and top scientists have a lot to say about it. They are presenting new research that supports choline as a required nutrient to optimize milk production, choline as a required nutrient to support a healthy transition, choline as a required nutrient to improve calf health and growth, and choline as a required nutrient to increase colostrum quantity. This new research is solidifying choline's role as a required nutrient for essentially every cow, regardless of health status, milk production level, or body condition score. Learn more about the science that is changing the game and the choline source that is making it happen. Reassure Precision Release Choline from Balchem. Visit balchem.com slash scientists say to learn more. So, Bill, as we get started, um, tell us a little bit about the paper that you selected and, and why you selected it. Well, the, the papers from Journal Dairy Science, like most of them, was published earlier. I don't have the month, but in 2023, I think around June. And it's titled Production Effects of Extruded Soybean Meal Replacing Canola Meal and Diets for Lactating Cows. 
I, I picked this for a couple of reasons. One is canola is becoming a fairly common ingredient in the U.S. And there's been a fair amount of data, uh, not just the U.S., showing comparing canola to soybean, uh, soybean meal. And in, in general, there's a few flaws with a lot of these comparisons. And I think this paper does a better job of giving a fairer uh, comparison of two ingredients or diets based on two different ingredients. Uh, the author of the paper is a graduate student, and Alex can uh, go into him his pedigree a little bit, but it's by Sergio Cuevo. And Alex, could you just give us a, a brief uh, history of him and, and what he's doing now or in the future? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think uh, his last name is pronounced Cueva. Uh, Sergio um, came first as a Zamorano uh, intern. Uh, Zamorano is the university down in Honduras. He's, he's from Honduras. Uh, uh, spent a couple of months here at Penn State and then uh, joined us as a master student. Uh, this converted into a PhD. Uh, degree and now he's uh, scheduled to finish uh, in spring next year and um, interviewing for jobs. I think he's mostly interested in the industry jobs. Um, so I don't think he will have any problems uh, finding one. He comes from a, a coffee farm. His family has a coffee farm in uh, Honduras. And he brought me coffee over the years, and it, it, it's great coffee. Alex, what I usually start with is is the hypothesis and objectives of the research. Could you you go into that uh, uh, briefly on on this project? Uh, sure. Uh, I may give you a little background too. Uh, I started looking into canola versus soybean meal based on a paper that. Uh, I, in fact, commissioned, I was an editor in the Canadian Journal of Animal Science, and I asked my buddy, Pekka Huchtanen, to do a review of uh, canola versus soybean meal. And that review came uh, out as very favorable to canola meal. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's how the, this whole story started. Uh, we have done quite a few studies uh, since then, uh, comparing soybean meal and different versions, extruded, uh, solvent, and canola meal. And the hypothesis in this particular paper was uh, following a crossover study uh, where we had a shorter periods in uh, uh, experimental periods with a continuous design study, uh, which is this particular paper, uh, comparing canola meal versus extruded soybean meal the hypothesis, in fact, was that uh, there will be no difference between in production effects. There will be no difference in the production uh, and milk composition uh, between canola meal and extruded soybean meal when they are fed on an equal crude protein basis in the diet. And I think, you know, in, the, in that meta-analysis, most of the comparisons were with solvent, soy. Yeah. And so that's one one big difference here is this is this product is more similar to because the canola is almost always extruded or expelled however you want to say that exactly that's that's what uh, is missing in a lot of the work that was done with canola meal uh, they are compared it's compared to solvent extract uh, soybean meal uh, which doesn't under, uh, doesn't uh, undergo uh, heat treatment canola has too much fat and uh, cannot be solvent extracted it has to be uh, uh, physically, uh, some of the oil has to be removed through extrusion and then solvent extracted. And during that extrusion, uh, there is heat generated and that increases RUP, as we know. Um, and um, it's really not, not fair, if you want, to compare canola meal, which is already extruded meal, to solvent extracted soybean meal. And, and you spent uh, your, your diet, well, if you briefly go over the two diets you used, and I do want to talk a bit more about those, but just big picture differences between the two diets. Yeah, I have to go back to the paper. Uh, uh, basically, we had between 13 to 15 percent inclusion rate uh, uh, with canola meal and extruded uh, soybean meal. 
And we did this on a crude pro- we replaced them on a crude protein basis. So there was a similar amount of crude protein coming from both meals. We did uh, something else uh, uh, which didn't make a lot of difference in the diets. Everything else was the same. All other feeds were the same, but we did include some oil, canola oil in the canola diet, canola meal diet to equal um, the eater extract. And we also uh, included some urea uh, to go uh, the, the protein, crude protein between the diets. Otherwise, everything else was exactly the same. And you did add, because of, of the lower inclusion rate of bean meal, you added a little bit of soy hulls to keep, the so starch is equal, the NDF is a little bit different just because it has to be. Oh, uh, sorry. We, we added uh, uh, soy hulls too, to, yep. to equal yep. NDF. Uh, of course, uh, the soybean meal has higher protein content. The extruded soybean meal has lower protein than soybean extracted because there is 8 to 10% oil left. Mm-hmm. Uh, but still, there is a difference with canola meal. And I think another important thing you did was you, you provided RP amino acids, metin, methionine, and lysine. So that you kind of removed that as a variable. So it's a... I think it's a more fair compare. You're comparing diets that are pretty equal, basically, nutritionally equal. Nutritionally equal. Uh, canola meal certainly has more methionine than a soybean meal of any kind. Uh, now, if you look through the literature, you will see methionine uh, in canola meal all over the place. If you look at the Canadian analysis, they are always higher than our analysis for. I don't know what reason, uh, but uh, it does have uh, higher methionine content. So we wanted to eliminate this as much as possible, and we added uh, uh, lysine and rumen-protected lysine and rumen-protected methionine to equal the two diets. And then also another positive of this study is instead of using book values for the protein fractions, you actually measured them. So you're you're really testing the product, not the, the accuracy of the book values. Yeah, Bill, that's a long story. And I don't know if we want to go into that one. But <laughs> I have my concerns with uh, NASM. Uh, uh, if you go to there, yeah. yeah. <laughs> let's let's not go. Let's not go that way. <laughs> it's from the literature number, but I think it's not the the right the right yeah. constant for canola is I think much too high. Yeah, ex- exactly, exactly. And NRC was was wrong. NRC was wrong. Now Nasum, I don't think it's much better. Yeah. Um, but uh, certainly because of that again uh, extrusion, um, canola meal typically has uh, lower RDP and higher RUP than what uh, the book values are. One, one thing that's always, like I said, I think the right constant in NASM is, is too, way too fast. But the thing you found, and also in NASM and also in NRC, is that the RUP digestibility is substantially lower for canola. And everybody gets about about 80% the value of soy. What, what yes. do you, why do you, so I think that's real. Why, why this do you is think real. It's, why do you think it's less digestible than, than soy protein? Yes, uh, definitely. This is one thing that uh, I don't think there is disagreement out there. Uh, even NASM and NRC has uh, similar uh, values there. The reason, Bill, I think, is uh, the higher um, ADF-bound uh, crude protein and NDF-bound crude protein. If you look at uh, actually this paper, we did analyze uh, both, and they are considerably higher. Let, let me go quickly to this uh, they are considerably higher in canola meal than in um, extruded soybean meal so for adfi uh, crude protein we have 2.4 uh, percent for canola meal versus 0.4 per percent for uh, the soybean meal and uh, ndf bound crude protein is 6.3 versus 0.7 so i think that uh, that's the reason the main reason for this difference do you, do you think that's a, a factor of processing or the plant? No, I don't think it's factor uh, a factor of processing. It's actually related to the plant, to the plant protein. Because if you look, 
we have an NOAgital ourselves, but if you look at the seeds uh, that are in the databases, uh, you will see that difference okay. still being there. Okay. Well, and then the last thing, just uh, for the audience, this was a big study. You had 24 cows per treatment. And like you said, this was not a Latin square. It was, I think, eight weeks or six weeks. I can't remember, but a continuous study, which is clearly that's right. better for, for protein studies. That's clearly superior. Well, I like to, we'll go ahead and move into the results. I always like to start with the, the main thing, and that's production. Uh, you could just kind of review what you found on, on production. Yes. So one thing with uh, the canola meal uh, meta-analysis or studies, have been the uh, higher dry mat intake. I don't know how you or your audience is familiar with this, but uh, seems like uh, consistently uh, when we compare the two meals, cows tend to eat more uh, of the canola meal, diets that have canola meal. There is something there that we still haven't figured out though. Is it a palatability problem? Is it some other kind of regulation? In this particular case, uh, again, as you said, with 24 cows per treatment, uh, long-term study, we did not see a statistical difference in dry matter intake, uh, 26 versus 26.2 versus 25.9. So um, very small numerical difference, but no statistical difference in dry matter intake, uh, no difference in uh, milk yield. Feed efficiency was not different. These cows were milking about 40 kilos, uh, which, what is that? Uh, 80, 88 80 something pounds. pounds. Yeah. Uh, yeah. One thing that we see here uh, was uh, increased milk fat percent. The canola meal cows had a 3.5. Uh, extruded soybean meal diet uh, was 3.95. This is something that uh, we don't see uh, consistently in, in our studies, but we have seen this with other uh, soybean related products or different uh, soybean trials that we have seen uh, that where, uh, you know, soybean oils tends to increase milk fat. So that's not too surprising here. Uh, and yield of uh, milk fat also increased. Uh, what else we have? Uh, en energy corrected milk, though, was not different. Uh, and feed efficiency on energy corrected milk basis was also not different. Alex, just real quick, uh, on the if, I can, side, if I can circle yes, back on, on that fat increase, is, is there a difference mm. in the fatty acid profile of the, uh, the two uh, different beans? Yeah, so uh, there is more oleic acid in canola meal. I mean, this is one reason canola oil is considered more healthy, if you want. Um, but uh, there is more linoleic acid in soybean uh, oil. And um, we have to go back to, to these studies that we have done uh, with uh, different fats. But I think this is one of the reasons that uh, we, we've seen increase in milk fat. Okay. The other thing... Uh, in this particular study is that we added the canola oil to the diet where the oil in the in the extruded meal was incorporated in the in the meal although it was you know broken seeds uh, ground and, and all that uh, but anyway i think this is the reason why we have seen that uh, there may be some inhibition of fermentation changing of the pathways of the biohydrogenation with the canola oil versus the um, soybean oil because of the different form of the oil in the diet. So, so it could be the, the canola diet is depressing fat rather than the soy is increased. Because to me, when I look at the numbers, it looks more like a mo very modest depression in fat. Rather very than modest, than exactly. And that's probably the reason because of the free oil that was added to the diet in this case. And one thing I forgot to mention earlier is that you also, you had a lot of first lactation cows in this study. So you could, you had enough power to look at parity effects, which they all did what we expected, but you had enough power to look at interactions. And I just want to say you basically found none. So this, these results are applicable to both first lactation and older cows, which a lot of studies are underpowered to look at parity interactions. So I just wanted to mention that. 
exactly. Um, for some things, we did find interactions in there in the tables. Uh, milk protein yield, for example, uh, was affected differently in primiparous versus multiparous. Uh, MUN, MUN, I should have mentioned that uh, was also uh, tended to be higher uh, for the uh, soybean diet versus the canola meal. And that's again typically what we'll see uh, with, when we compare canola meal versus uh, soybean meal. But yeah, you are right. There was no other differences built here in um, body condition score. We monitored body weight, which is one thing we uh, emphasize with these continuous trials when we look exactly. at amino acids, particularly or protein. Uh, and there was no difference there as far as I can tell here. And when I, I did some calculations on total energy use using NASM equations and the, the soy diet, if you based on milk maintenance and body weight change, had about one one megacal more energy. But with all the estimates, you know, that's there's no difference at all. Those are well within the errors of estimation. Yeah. So th these diets were probably pretty, pretty equal in, in NEL or ME both. Yeah. Um, you, you measured some, we'll go briefly into this, but you, you did do, you had cannulated cows, some cannulated cows. So you did measure, uh, uh, some room and fermentation measures. Can you kind of go over the important findings on, on that? Yeah. Let me take a look at that table. Uh, so we did see an increase in total VFA, uh, concentration, no difference in pH. That probably goes back, Bill, to the fat, to the oil that was added, free oil, with the canola um, diet versus the extruded soybean diet, because that's a that's a quite a significant difference here yeah. in the total VFA. So there may have been some inhibition of the free oil um, versus uh, the extruded soybean meal, where the oil was basically enclosed into the into the seed material. Yeah. Uh, in terms of different uh, uh, fatty acids, uh, there was actually more uh, proportionally more propionate with the canola uh, versus the soybean diet and um, less um, acetate. So there was a little shift there uh, in those two major fatty acids. Uh, valerate was also um, higher in, uh, in the canola diet. Uh, let's see what else here. Protozoa. Seems like protozoa numbers were increased. Uh, and that's probably, again, related to the oil. Now, the shift in the propionate is, uh, is something interesting, propionate acetate ratio. Um, and I tend to think it's, again, probably because of the oil and the type of oil we, we added to, to the diet. It, it kind of goes in line with the lower milk fat as well. Is uh, exactly shift in. Yeah. And then I'm going to go to table six, which is amino acids, and this is something I always have trouble interpreting as plasma amino acids. How, how yeah. do you, I guess, just as a general question, how how do you interpret plasma concentrations of plasma amino acids? So, I mean. I think there is some relation there, Bill, with uh, amino acid deficiency, if you want. In fact, our histidine, since uh, uh, the histidine was mentioned, our histidine work started uh, by looking at plasma amino acid concentrations, and we have consistently seen in our low protein uh, diet trials uh, decreased plasma histidine. So that's, that's how the histidine work started at Penn State. Uh, so we tend, to, uh, when we do protein diets, if we have enough funding, because those analyses are not cheap, right. uh, we tend to analyze uh, plasma amino acids. Um, what we have seen here, particularly, we were looking at these three amino acids, although two were supplemented, but we were interested to see whether there was some effect on, uh, on histidine. I should have mentioned, Bill, our intention was to feed slightly below uh, the MP requirements of the cows. This was done during uh, the NRC 
uh, time and uh, we were working at NRC, not NASM. But again, that's another entirely different topic. And we were targeting, I think, uh, 5% deficiency in MP. But we didn't get there with one of the diets, I think with the extruded soybean meal diet. So our intention was to look at histidine particularly uh, at a uh, 5% deficiency in MP. That did not uh, work uh, well. And as you can see in that table here, there was no difference in histidine. Uh, there was some difference in some of the other essential amino acids. Uh, for example, isoleucine uh, was higher with uh, soybean meal. Leucine was also higher. So there was some um, total essential amino acids were not different, but some individual essential amino acids were higher with the extruded soybean meal diet. So, so do you interpret this as amino acid supply was similar, or you know, because if if one goes up, is it because something is limiting, say, milk protein production, so there's an excess of it, or? Like I said, I just have a lot of trouble with if, <laughs> if, a, if a number goes up, is it good or bad, I guess, is some, one of the questions I have. I, Bill, I, you know, I don't want to put too much uh, emphasis on this, but if I, if I see a, a, a strong decrease in one uh, uh, essential amino acid, that would uh, uh, probably indicate a deficiency. Okay. Uh, no, I'm not talking about increases, decreases. So in this case here, I mean, obviously, RUP digestibility is considerably higher in uh, the extruded uh, soybean meal versus the canola meal. So I think the differences, although total differences are not there, there are some individual amino acids that are higher in uh, the soybean meal, and that's probably because of the higher digestibility of RUP, intestinal digestibility. <laughs> So we we were thought that uh, thought that uh, lysine is one of the amino acids that suffer heat, right? In, in yes. these products, and it seems that it's not happening, right? In extruded soybean meal, at least in the the product that you use placed on this table, right? Yeah, no, you are right. Uh, so this meal, I, if I be, if I remember the numbers correctly, was about 170 degrees Celsius, which comes to 340, I think, uh, Fahrenheit. We did a study quite a few years ago, probably 10 years ago, where we increased temperatures uh, up to 200 degrees and then look at lysine. And only when you exceed, I think when you exceed 180 and get to, to the 200 degrees heat, then lysine uh, starts disappearing and digestibility decreases. At the typical extrusion temperature, and you have to understand, this is not a temperature that is strictly regulated. It's simply friction that creates temperature. There is no heat input, uh, but that's a typical extrusion temperature, about 320 Fahrenheit. I don't think there is much effect on lysine. Uh, on, you took some blood values, and uh, you know, BA, or ketones, BHBA, no difference. Fatty acids, no big difference. Uh, urea, no big difference, but you did find higher plasma plasma glucose in the canola diet. Yes, first, yeah. is there, what, what's the what's the reason? What what reason are you thinking? Is there a, a significance to that? A biological mm -hmm. significance to that? Well, quite uh, quite a big difference here, and uh, you know, of course, we look at our data uh, uh, and we we screen the data quite quite uh, rigorously and. Uh, that, that difference was there. Uh, the only explanation bill we had, I think, was uh, the propionate, uh, increased propionate, rumen propionate. As, as we all know, propionate is the main uh, gluconeogenic uh, amino acid, um, um, volatile fatty acid. So I think that's where that difference is coming from. Do you think there, what's what's the result, biological result of that higher glucose, if, if any, do you think it, it didn't, didn't relate to more lactose production. Yeah, uh, we, we obviously didn't see that here. Um, I don't think there was a, any biological effect with these diets in terms of production or milk composition. So just just an, just another energy source then. Just another energy increased energy uh, source of glucose. 
then, you know, this was a pretty extensive study. You also measured digestibility. Yeah. Um, which, you know, one of th I spent 30 years measuring digestibility, so I always liked digestibility data. Uh, you found no, no difference, uh, basically no difference in, in dry matter digestible organic matter, which again suggests essentially equal energy values in these diets. You also didn't find a difference in nitrogen or crude protein digestibility, even though canola has a significant, substantially lower RUP digestibility. What what do you think is going on there? Yeah, so don't forget that uh, we did add urea to the diet. So it's not just we, we try to equal, uh, you know, the, the protein by adding uh, urea. So maybe that interfered with uh, the nitrogen data. Uh, in terms of digestibility, we did see <laughs> one difference here that's in the table. Uh, increased ADF digestibility with the extruded soybean meal diet. Uh, so that's uh, hard, hard to interpret. Uh, again, we added we added soy house to this diet to to equal NDF, um, and then maybe there was some difference there with uh, ADF, the type of ADF, uh, and that caused digestibility. We also have to keep in mind these are marker studies, including the urine data. Uh, there, is, there is always some variability because of the markers. But uh, yeah, we didn't see any uh, nitrogen balance uh, data except a uh, few that I don't think uh, are of any significance. Uh, there were some interactions here between um, for, with parity. But I don't. I don't think these are important differences to, to discuss. On the, on the you, you found a better ADF digestibility with soy mm -hmm. diet, which to me, you know, the, the the fiber in canola meal isn't very digestible, no. um, whereas the the fiber in soy hulls is quite digestible. So I think that explains it. But you also yeah. you didn't find a difference in NDF digestibility, and usually those are pretty highly correlated. Yes. What, what yeah. do you think is going on there? Uh, I can't. I can't tell you why we didn't see that uh, difference here. Uh, in fact, there seems to be almost numerical, numerically higher um, NDF digestibility with the canola meal versus extruded soybean meal. Again, those are uh, complete diets. Uh, the, the the influence of canola and soybean meal in these diets at 13, 15% inclusion and very low NDF in both feeds uh, will be small. So there is a lot of variability here and I wouldn't, I wouldn't put too much emphasis on, on these differences. Did, did, did you, and I, I, it may be in the paper, and I may have missed it. Did you look at nitrogen free NDF digestibility or would this be just NDF digestibility? No, we did not. That's a, that's a good point. This is just NDF, total NDF uh, digestibility. That, that's a good point, Bill. Uh, we may have to go back and look at uh, this data. The, the diets are, like you pointed out earlier, are quite different in NDIN or NDICP. And that's, that right. Might explain that's right. The two um, feeds are different. The diets yeah. may not be that different. Exactly, exactly. And then in, in your... Uh, Nitrogen digestibility data, again, they're very, both very good. And, and, you know, it's marker data, but they look very reasonable. It isn't like you've got some some goofy numbers. They here. do. Yeah. Is, you know, the when I did the calculations on using your room and digestibility data, your uh, RUP digestibility data, you know, when you, you figure out the total nitrogen in the diet, the difference it really is pretty small. And it's likely you're, you're, you won't me measure it with total crude protein digestibility you just it's just too small feed, yeah. feed nitrogen is not the major source of fecal nitrogen it's in that's digest. right that's right yeah and the numbers uh, look reasonable to me too they, um, they look very again. reasonable i think they're not uh, they all look quite reasonable so i have a I have a question related with the diet probably and maybe it's a little bit out of topic but in my world, sometimes we tend to use uh, corn silage as the only source of forage. Do you think that 
changing from canola meal to strudic soybean meal will dif have different results in that kind of diet, 100% corn silage forage. And in this diet, you have 15% or 14% alfalfa silage, haylage, sorry. It's... Uh, do you think that the, the forage source will change the response? Okay, well, uh, if I understood your question, it's not 100% corn silage diet. We have alfalfa haylage. We had a little bit of straw as well here. You are asking if, if the diet was completely corn silage uh, forage? Is that what you are asking? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't think the response will be different. I don't think the response will be different. Uh, we Again, haylage contributes to, to the nitrogen uh, input here, but... Uh, that both diets were equal on alpha alpha helix, so I don't think that's a factor here. It would, you know, with these corn silage, it includes the in, increases the inclusion rate of these protein supplements a lot if you get rid of alpha alpha. So I don't know if it, if it if it shows up or if it's more or less likely to have an effect, but if it, that's another experiment, I guess. So we. You know, we try to make it as practical and as, uh, uh, you know, appealing to industry as, as possible. This study was funded, uh, you know, by industry here. So um, we, did, we didn't want to make diets that are not realistic. And I don't, I don't think anybody will feed more than 15% of these meals in a diet, typical diet. Like I always told my students, you can't answer every question with one experiment. So. No. <laughs> um, let's let's go into you know nitrogen uh, excretion is is a big deal now. Um, yeah, and you you you've got a lot on the the, the nitrogen excretion data. On your urine and excretion was statistically the same, but. You got more urine, statistically more urine, urea, nitrogen excretion with the um, let me say with the with the soy. It was twenty grams more, but the total nitrogen was not. It was ten grams more. It wasn't statistical. What again? I I used to see in high correlations between urea, urine, urea, nitrogen excretion, and total urine, and this seems to be a little bit out of whack. Do you? have an explanation for that or is this not not uncommon it may not be as common as i think so they both will go in the same direction mm -hmm. uh, you are pro probably uh, talking about uh, uh, different sizes here in the effect uh, there is about 10 grams versus 20 grams in urinary urea uh, and urinary total nitrogen that probably that's what you mean. Yeah. Um, let me see here. I mean, we have about 60% urinary urea of the total nitrogen, which, which I think is perfectly within the range yeah. Yeah. that we typically see. Uh, we all know in terms of environment, urine nitrogen is what is the important one, not fecal nitrogen. Um, if we did measure fecal ammonia emissions, for example, we may have seen some higher ammonia emissions uh, with the soy diet versus the canola meal because of this higher, um, numerically, you know, not statistically, but still higher urinary nitrogen. <clears throat> so if that's your point, I think uh, if, if we have done this work, there may have been some higher ammonia emissions from that manure. It'd be, it'd be pretty... The difference would be pretty small, though. I mean, it pretty small differences. Yeah. So I, I'd say, in general, the environmental impact of the a nitrogen basis would be essentially mm -hmm. equal. I don't think it's a big deal. That's right. Um, That's right. Nitrogen efficiency, um, you know, milk in versus diet in. These were about, um, if I remember, it averages that there's a little difference between parities, but it's going to be about 26, 27 percent. Um, is that yep. good or bad? Or you've done a lot of this stuff is okay. Yeah. 
Well, when we have done this, uh, you know, meta-analysis and so on, we, we came up with about 25, 25% nitrogen efficiency. For That was about maybe 10, 15 years ago, though. Uh, I think there is a trend to feed less nitrogen nowadays, and that will increase in addition to increased milk production and milk uh, protein yield. I think that will increase uh, milk nitrogen efficiency. So if somebody has done an updated meta-analysis, maybe the, this will come to about 27% now for the US, uh, uh, US data, because European data were at the time slightly higher because they do feed low protein diets there. I think uh, the average was about 27% versus 25% uh, in North American diets. So I think this uh, 20, you know, 27, 28% is about right uh, what what you see in, in the modern uh, diets and dairy cows in the U.S. This, I'm going to ask you your opinion now, but how low in protein, these were 16.5% crude proteins. Yeah. How low do you think you could have gone without, you know, we don't want to hurt production that's sure, not economically sure. or environmentally friendly but how, how how low do you think you could have gone in this bill we have done a lot of work with this uh, low protein diets uh, and we have gone down to 14 percent again with cows that produce about 80 90 pounds of milk and then we see a decrease in milk production um, so i would say if we had to uh, guess here, sixteen uh, percent. Certainly, we wouldn't uh, see uh, an effect on production if we have gone down below sixteen. Uh, that that will depend. Again, if if you do, a, I mean, that's the thing. If you do a crossover trial, you are not probably going to see differences even at fifteen and a half percent. But if you do a continuous design trial where you give the cows enough time. To, to respond to these low protein diets, uh, my guess uh, would be that at 16, at uh, 15 and a half percent, you will see uh, some loss of production, uh, even even probably some uh, body weight uh, loss, because we have seen that. In cases where we don't see a milk effect, uh, pro a milk production effect, we actually see a body weight effect in in these long term <laughs> continuous design studies. So you got a good point. You got to measure all responses. You don't don't you, leap you to do, conclusions. You do. And you can't do it in a crossover crossover <laughs> trial. Agree, one hundred percent. My my last question. So I have a quick. Uh, I have a quick question. So at, at the beginning, you said that you plan for ninety five percent MP in the diets, but you couldn't accomplish that. If you were able to do it again and accomplish the 95% MP, there is any result here that would change? Probably the, the protein metabolism, but uh, in terms of production, yeah, do you uh, think that's... The efficiency, certainly the uh, nitrogen efficiency would, yeah. would improve and uh, nitrogen losses would increase. I don't think uh, we, have, we would have seen uh, uh, changes in, um, in, in, the mil in the production milk production responses or the milk uh, milk protein um, effects. Because again, that again, I don't want to go too deep into this, but at 5% in our data, 5 to 7% MP deficiency, but this is NRC bill. <laughs> uh, we did not, we, ha we have not seen uh, a decrease in milk production or milk, uh, milk protein effects. When we go below five seven percent deficiency, then we see uh, have seen a, a decrease in production. That that's because NRC were over, overestimating MP. Yes, uh, uh, NRC was overestimating. No question about this. Uh, we have done. We have we have looked at uh, NASM, um, but again, we don't want to go there. We have an abstract uh, that. Uh, is coming uh, next year in uh, based on our you know continuous design trials. Yeah, 
I think the other thing people need to remember is all these protein numbers, no matter what model, they're all estimated. They are all they calculations. All, have, they're all they estimations. They all have error. They all have error. <laughs> Absolutely. Really, even, if, Absolutely. even if it predicts the average perfectly, there's still error. And yeah. so a 5% difference to me is probably just within the, the error of prediction of all these It's things. all calculations. It's all calculations. Be, but the cows don't lie, Bill. The cows yeah, don't I, lie. I, that's exactly right. So, yeah. You know, in dairy nutrition, we feed uh, two things, right? We feed the rumen, we feed the cow. And, and I just found myself wondering as we were talking through some of this, uh, would, it, would it be important to measure maybe what's going on with microbial populations and species within the rumen? And would that be important to know that? <laughs> Alex measured some things that are our are, are bigger picture of rumen fermentation yeah. measures. Right. I'm not a microbiologist, but I think he, some of the differences in the fatty at VFAs he found ha, has to be microbial. So someone could yeah. delve into that, find reasons, and that might be ha, have other significance. So, But it is what you said is correct. We got to look at both rumen. And we want a very efficient rumen, but we also need a very efficient cow. So you have to feed both, correct? Yeah. 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 You know, you have to decide how far you go with this analysis. Yeah. In most cases, fermentation is enough for me. If I want to follow on the fermentation and see what is causing that effects, then I'll do a microbial analysis, uh, which is more expensive. You can't go the other way around. You can't look at the microbial effects and try to deduct uh, other effects from there because that's not going to make any sense. This is only a tool, and if you, if you use properly, you know it will give you some additional information. People tend to make too much out of it, I think, nowadays. Yeah, makes sense. Marcos, anything else? I know this is your first time to the Real Science Exchange. Uh, I forgot to tell you, your primary job is to at least come up with one question to stump Bill. Um, I'm not sure we've done that yet today. <laughs> okay. Now, maybe it's a general and practical question for for both of our uh, guests. But in the real world, how nutrition is managed, the, the change in price of these commodity, commodities, canola meal and extruded soybean meal, how they, of course, they will not add oil, right? So when they need to switch from one source of protein to another, basically they need to reform. I'll answer first and let Alex have the final word. You know, if you look at the meta-analysis, very often it's uh, you replace it on a crude protein basis and then you fill it in with maybe starch or byproduct fiber. And, you know, we don't balance diets for crude protein anymore. And so I think one of the strengths of this study is they looked at a ton of amino acid supply, MP supply, RDP, all this stuff, and tried to make these diets truly equal nutritionally, not just equal in crude protein. And I think that's why in this study, they, they were equal because the diets were equal. In a lot of these other studies, the diets are not equal. They're not the same diets. Yeah, yeah. Uh, again, yeah. I'll just reiterate what Bill said at the beginning. Again, you cannot compare solvent extracted soybean meal with canola meal and say this is better than that one. It's comparing as as you say apples and oranges you know a fair comparison is with something that has gone the the heat treatment that canola meal is undergoing uh, when when it's processed and and in that case there will be no difference right uh, our data show that uh, if you do this there will be no difference in in production responses Gentlemen, what I'd like to do as, as we wrap up here is give each of you an opportunity just to kind of kind of give your final thoughts. And, and Marcos, I'm going to start with you. What's some things that you might have learned today that, that has application uh, for, for the producers and customers that you call on? Tonight's last call question is brought to you by NitroSure, Precision Release Nitrogen. NitroSure delivers a complete TMR for the rumen microbiome, helping you feed the microbes that feed your cows. 
To learn more about maximizing microbial protein output while reducing your carbon footprint, visit balcom.com slash nitrosure. Well, the, the, the application and something that I will use in the future is that when we switch from one and change, basically have the same diet, basically as Bill and, and Alexander says, right? You don't change production or, or components in the in, in the milk, right? Something that I see those mistakes quite often, okay? Even with soybean meal versus a two d soybean meal, which are different protein sources, similar but different. So something, a mistake that I saw quite often here in Latam. So that's my take home message. Thank you for that, Marcos. Sure. Alex, um, what, what's a, a, a few things that, uh, that you think you learned from the study that you'd like to share with the audience tonight? And, and our audience typically is a uh, consulting nutritionist, feed company nutritionist. We've got a lot of academia out there, students. So what kind of uh, things would you like to impart to them? I mean, again, uh, I, I, will, I will just uh, repeat what I already said. If feed intake, when you're comparing these two meals, if feed intake is not affected, uh, you will have a similar response uh, between extruded soybean meal, extruded soybean meal, not solvent extracted soybean meal, and canola meal. Now, most of the data out there are comparing solvent extracted uh, soybean meal with canola meal, and that's not a fair comparison. Fair enough. Bill, any final words you want to put a bow on this for us? Well, I just want to emphasize, you know, when there's a lot of papers out there comparing ingredients, that's not an uncommon thing. And readers need to look at the diets, not just make sure you see if, you know, if a diet is deficient in RDP because of an ingredient substitution, does that make the ingredient bad or does it make the diet bad? So really delve into the details when people are comparing two different feed supplements to, to say, are the diets really equal? And are you comparing the ingredients or are you comparing difference in diets? Yeah, nice summary, Bill. Gentlemen, this has been a lot of fun. I learned a lot. This has been very engaging. I want to thank you for joining us here tonight at the Real Science Exchange. To our loyal listeners, uh, thank you once again for coming along with us on this uh, this episode of uh, the, the Journal Club. We hope you learned something. We hope you had some fun, and we hope to see you next time here at the Real Science Exchange, where it's always happy hour, and you're always among friends. We'd love to hear your comments or ideas for topics and guests, so please reach out via email to anh.marketing at balchem.com with any suggestions, and we'll work hard to add them to the schedule. Don't forget to leave a five-star rating on your way out. You can request your Real Science Exchange t-shirt in just a few easy steps. Just like or subscribe to the Real Science Exchange and send us a screenshot along with your address and t-shirt size to anh.marketing at balchem.com. Balchem's Real Science Lecture Series of Webinars continues with ruminant-focused topics on the first Tuesday of every month, monogastric-focused topics on the second Tuesday of each month, and quarterly topics for the companion animal segment. Visit balchem.com slash real science to see the latest schedule and to register for upcoming webinars.